Here we go. Brian Summer. Well, good morning, John Reed. John and I are here at the Acumatica Summit 2018 in beautiful uh, downtown Nashville. Yeehaw. Yes, indeed. And it's a record crowd here. Yeah, this was a pretty, pretty impressive thing to see in its size. Um, John ran into me when I got in Sunday night and told me that the expo hall just kept going and going and going and going. Pretty much. And you know what? He he didn't underestimate that at all. Um, and we're telling you this because Acumatica is actually a really new software company as far as ERP vendors go, although it is celebrating its 10th anniversary now. But it takes a long time to build a lot of products to have an ERP suite. and uh, and to build the partner channels and the marketing messages and uh, build a customer base and on and on and on. And we sure saw a lot of evidence that they've actually hit a lot of those marks along the way. Yes, we did. And we saw a Sage mug that almost got shattered during the <laughs> keynote today. <laughs> there, was, there wasn't that much vendor trash talk this time around, but there was a Sage mug that that, yeah, there was, uh, that, uh, that didn't that barely survived a RFID experiment. Yeah, that was hilarious. Um, and the <laughs> demo for the you know for the listeners, uh, a live demo on stage. They were pulling all these products out to show their QR co or RFID code kind of technology and blockchain stuff. And as they're pulling them out, one of the things that comes out was a Sage <laughs> coffee mug. And the guy's like, oh, man, how did that get here? And then he throws it right off the reader and, uh, into the back curtains behind the it stage. Because didn't, it didn't qualify as a cloud ERP in yeah. the sensor. Yeah, so, so it, couldn't, it couldn't go through uh, the system. Uh, it, was a, it was a nice comedic It moment. wouldn't be a vendor show without trash talk. But, but anyhow, just, just to frame for the listeners real quick, because like, you and I have done a fair amount of Acumatica podcasts, to me, why I think listeners should care about Acumatica is because they're an upstart player. They're in the middle of what I would say is an important conversation about modern business software and what constitutes modern ERP and modern business software in general. And that's a really interesting conversation. We've had a number of top discussions on those themes the last couple of days, and they're not the only vendor trying to chip away at that issue. It's a really mm -hmm. important one. But that to me is what I always think about when I'm here is, is, you know, now you have a chance to think about what would a modern approach to ERP look like. Yeah, and I know I just did a piece uh, for Diginomica, and that's not meant to be a shameless plug. But, but I, it is, but it's good, yeah. Okay, Check Diginomica.com, folks, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, John. But I did this piece, and I bucketed out uh, the HR software market space into three groups. And, and one of those groups are the traditional vendors who's who are selling, call them newer cloud-based products. But really, the only thing new about them is that they run on a newer platform. And just because the platform might be in memory doesn't necessarily mean that they've actually changed anything fundamentally with the products relative to data models or new analytics, whatever, that are using some of this new capability. So, yeah, what is a modern ERP? You can put lipstick on a pig, but if it's still, if it was still a system that was designed for 80 column punch cards, it, you know, putting it on a new platform isn't really that terribly exciting. These guys didn't, they don't have all that baggage to begin with. So right. I think the discussion here is, okay, so how do they take their solution that's running in AWS and all these other you know characteristics and how is it going to fire up with all the new cool stuff that's available today? Right. And we could have a whole quite long podcast around the different components of modern ERP. We're not going to go down that road right now, but but I think one real takeaway is that it's an important conversation, particularly because as vendors start to figure out the items on that list, they start to push out, oh, we're we're a cloud product, or oh, we have we have all these APIs, and it's really important for customers to realize that that those statements aren't all created equal, right? And so part Correct. of this discussion is how do you ask intelligent questions to help you to discern who the real players are in, in, in the modern push and who are just kind of the lipstick on a pig. Um, but that we can address in future articles in, in other contexts. The, the thing that we were going to start with here was just on the growth rates. So what yeah. are your thoughts there? Well, they, they threw out some interesting stats. I mean, here's, again, a company that in just a few years has gone from nothing to over 4,000 customers. There were 1,100 attendees at this show. And as I referenced at the top of the uh, recording, uh, they had an expo area that just wrapped all the way around uh, this uh, 
uh, conference facility. And I mean, vendors on both sides. It was, it was impressive. Uh, I think one improvement too with this show is that it was it started as a partner event, and Correct. and now you're seeing more and more of a customer presence. And as the two groups intermingle, it becomes a much more interesting show on a lot of levels. So, yeah, and I think it, I think it, that actually helps m- justify why more and more partners show up here is because there's more and more customers and prospects, I guess, to uh, draw on. There were actually a number of prospects here too. Um, I even subtly asked uh, the CMO here if they would color code the badges so I could find them easier uh, in our travels through the hallways here. But, you know, again, uh, the expo, the attendees, the uh, customer count, they, in the last year, they've added 37 new independent software vendors. They added 61 new application, um, excuse me, resellers, VARs, those kind of folks. 144% new revenue growth. Yep. Uh, and that's 144%. Not not now we got to parse it yeah well no it's not uh it's not 44 percent uh, you know yeah. that's a year over year growth of 144 which is pretty pretty substantive now this company can withstand that kind of growth uh without a big capital draw simply because uh, most of their product is sold by well, almost all of it is sold by partners and resellers and distributors and as a result, they don't have quite the huge um, customer sales, marketing, and other kind of staff that a lot of ERP vendors have. Their biggest component in their workforce is clearly their R&D group. That's the lion's share of their uh, personnel complement. So I think when we talk about these growth rates, the, the obvious question that jumps out is is why, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's spot on. And I think there's some very valuable lessons that many other vendors, if, uh, if competitors are listening to this, they ought to pay heed to these points. Uh, I heard from three different partners yesterday when I asked them why did they join this ecosystem. And um, uh, two of the three immediately volunteered this one point, and that was that uh, Acumatica does not view channel partners as a profit center. And they don't charge channel partners to sign up. They don't charge channel partners to take training. They don't charge for any of the training, which is pretty significant. Yes. Yep. And But at the same breath, they expect everyone, including, and this, was real, this is more newer uh, for them, the partner owner or president, CEO, whatever, of the partner firm, they must go through the training immediately, and they must pass. Mm. And if they don't, they get drubbed out. Right. Uh, which they found out that one of the keys to success is you can't just have a firm sign up to be a partner, but if the... If the head honcho of the company is not personally vested in that solution, right. then they're not going to push it. Let's they're not face make it, the there's changes. a lot of enterprise vendors with bloated, you might even say flatulent partner counts mm-hmm. of, of partners that actually are not delivering on projects properly. And so that's a huge issue. Yeah, that's the sad thing. And the vast majority of companies, it's not even a Pareto rule where, you know, the 80-20 kind of deal where 20% of the partners are dragging 80% of the revenue. And a lot of ecosystems, it's about more like 3% of the partners are dragging about 90, 99% of the revenue in there. And there's way too many partners that are partners on paper, but haven't ever really done anything. I think another piece of that too, in terms of the growth piece, is the the verticalization of the product, right? And Acumatica, based on its platform, has has made it possible for partners to build out significant extensions. Yeah. Um, the I talked to the retail POS guys; um, they're rocking right now. Um, you hear a bunch of stories from the manufacturing that are using the Jams manufacturing component and new verticals being announced. So, for example. Construction is a big one that that was announced just recently, and that was where Acumatica said, "Look, there's no real vertical cloud ERP play in this market. We think there needs to be one, and and you build it out, and and there it is. And and just the surprise they got from all the construction companies they were showing during the keynote of like, wow, you know, like there was nothing like this for me. They're forced forced to kind of look at proprietary products that don't really have the scope of a cloud ERP product." Yeah, a colleague of ours, Vinny Merchandani, I mean, he's just been railing lately at one ERP vendor after another that none of them actually want to build any of the deep vertical kind of applications that are out there. Uh, you know, with, in utilities, it's billing systems and so forth. And yet, 
it's interesting here at Acumatic. I mean, it's just every, most of the demos you see are like the one we saw, the tree farming company that, right. you know, is hooking up all kinds of water and other sensors uh, next to plants. And the data is going to get fed into a, da, 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 an Acumatica system. And they've got systems for, um, well, the one that gets me still is the... Um, medicinal marijuana industry and uh, right. they've got them for omni-channel retailing for like the shoe companies and others and they keep building out more and more verticals and they do it because for them it's easy for them to do it right whereas i think a lot of the other vendors they lack two things they either lack a product line that actually allows easy development of these things or they don't have any subject matter experts or they are unwilling to create subject matter experts right. and bring them into their firm to build them out. Got it. Okay. Any other components you wanted to hit on the, the sort of why the growth is happening or should we move to the next? Uh, let's go to the next. All right. All right. What's the next board member? Yeah. There, um, John, and I both had the pleasure independently of meeting one of the newest uh, members of the board uh, here at uh, Acumatica. And over the years, I've met a couple of the others, some of the mostly founders. And uh, this one is a former Microsoft exec who also happened to be the CEO of Citrix. And yeah, and that's, not only a Microsoft exec, he had a leading role in Dynamics, which is kind of a big coup for Acumatica to bring a Dynamics person on board. Not so much that they want to become Dynamics, but that he, I think he told me he was managing something like 10,000 partners at one point. So he knows a little bit about scaling an ERP business. Yeah. And I think uh, Curl's uh, biggest value to Acumatica long term might be just that point. It's bringing a, uh, bring the knowledge of how you scale a business to epic levels would be hopefully the best thing he can bring to the, uh, to the organization. Yeah. And the big question for me as I watch Acumatic will be, can they, can they grow and scale without losing some of the things that have really given them an edge in terms of their customer and partner intimacy? So that'll be interesting. But, but I talked with um, the board member around that. Carol is his name. If I butchered his name, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but at any rate, I tried to get him to talk trash about Microsoft Dynamics, but I was unsuccessful in that goal. Yeah. But but I am going to be writing about the interview, so I will put that up there. All so. right. Um, and if there's one thing I know you know, where I ask blunt force trauma kinds of questions, you, you ask yours in a very more um, snarky and backhanded yeah. way. I like um, to dig. But we're both devastatingly good. Either way we, we get there. <laughs> yeah, we get to the destination. Well, beyond that, I think another area we ought to talk about is uh, what's going to be the approach to the next generation kind of uh, world for, of ERP my uh, Acumatica. Right. And that's really important, I think, for for customers to be thinking about as well as just listeners in general. When we talk about what is modern ERP, it's like now the whole stakes of that have changed because now you're really looking at it not just in terms of you know what would constitute a an internal sort of cloud transactional product, but but how am I going to make smart decisions using external data sources? How am I going to embed machine learning components? Is there a role for blockchain in all this? And every pretty much every vendor has to have answers to these questions. The problem is, how do you do that without just lathering on the the hype of like, Alexa, what's going on with my blockchain? Is there an intelligent predictive mechanism that can tell me, you know, to mow my lawn in an hour? Uh, so, you know, there's an issue there. And so Acumatica tried to address that today during their keynote through a series of, I would say, very practical demos in, in different technology areas. Yeah, we saw some of their what they're thinking is going to be in areas like machine learning and natural language processing and the like. Uh, I thought the one that probably was the most, the most immediately pragmatic uh, deal had dealt with their their new workflow capabilities but if I could pull the discussion up, uh, you're right, John. Everybody's got an opinion uh, at every vendor or a cutesy little demo snippet they want to show. And customers, you know, it's kind of like getting, you know, uh, it's like going ooh and ah when you walk through a house for sale. Oh, it's got granite countertops, but who cares if termites have eaten the whole structure out from underneath it? Yep. Um, and, you know, you got to look beyond you got to look beyond the sex appeal of some of these new things and figure out what's really going to happen. Uh, the work 
and one of the cautions I'd put out there, not just for Acumatic, but all the ERP vendors, is I hear people say things like, we want to find how we're going to incorporate these new technologies and the data that they either generate or consume into our ERP system. And I'm not sure that's the right approach. I've not never been convinced of that because... Most of what happens in ERP has been uh, dealing with transactions. That's what they're about. Right. And if you're going to be parsing social sentiment data, you probably need a completely different kind of technology architecture that either is plowing through Hadoop or some other kind of big in-memory databases. And if you're dealing with like sensor-driven data, you need some kind of technology that's going to up front strip out a lot of uh, basically static null records that are just reporting status as usual to finally get you to the real anomalies. I think different business problems will pop up that are not the core competency of an ERP system and may require different underlying technology and platform components than a core ERP. And I think the real question is, how do people use these technologies in mm. conjunction with an ERP that it gives you an mm. ideal kind of business outcome? And that's where we need to move and elevate the discussion going forward. Yeah, and I think I think Acumatic has done some good thinking on the on the second part because one of the things they are always looking at with these next gen demos is how do you then bring the right transactional pieces back and automate those, right? So so if I'm talking to the way Acumatica thinks about it, if I'm talking to Alexa about some issue and I order something, Acumatic is going to think about, well, how can we generate an invoice for that and put it back into the system? And so they deal really well with the automating the transactional parts when they think about this, but that's not the whole picture, right? That's part of it. That's part of it. And and kudos that they get that much of it already and are working on it. I'm just kind of pointing out there's yeah. a structural issue in the industry and almost a level of hubris from ERP vendors who actually believe that somehow all the data in the world needs to belong in their ERP right. system. It's like they still think that the ERP is the center of all digital information. And I'm going to call BS on that right now. And even though those are my initials, I'm calling BS on it. Okay. <laughs> well, and that's and that's that's something I talked about with a customer yesterday uh, called X Byte Tech. And they're they're they were talking with me about how they they do, and I'll be writing up this use case, but they for certain scenarios, um, they work within Acumatica, but in others they need to export data into third party systems to sort of crunch what they're doing. And part of that is because some of the key data that they need for what you're describing these next gen scenarios lives outside their ERP system. And that's a reality. Um, but I think one thing that I like about how Acumatic is thinking about it is they're always thinking about how can we make this accessible? Because what I was hearing from these guys was the good thing is we can always get at the data in multiple number of ways from Acumatic, whether it's APIs or other forms of integration. And so that part they really liked is that Acumatic never stands in their way and says, you know, uh, this is going to cost you, or this is going to be difficult or so that part I think Acumatic is on top of, but some of this is just early days. Like, so for example, in the keynote today, we saw that a uh, Cherry Lake, an Acumatic customer, they were showing off sensors they're going to be putting in the soil um, that's going to pull back valuable information on soil conditions and stuff like that back into the system. But that's like in, that's just an initial deployment right now. So next year, they'll be much further along. Well, let's, let's carry that on even further. What a vendor like, what a uh, customer like that really wants is they actually want that data to feed into a more robust cost accounting system. They need to know exactly how much did that incremental amount of fertilizer or water and, uh, you know, cost and add to the unit cost of growing each one of these uh, shrubs or trees, what have you. And they want to then be able to compare that to standard versus actual kind of cost structure and everything else. Show me a cost accounting module, anybody, Scott, that ever thought about dealing with mm -hmm. such digitally tiny levels of detail and that kind of accuracy and those kind of data volumes. It just doesn't exist. And this goes, right. again, back to... Uh, we're just at the beginning of how companies have to reimagine how their systems are going to be working uh, in a digital uh, in a digital kind of existence. Yep.
And that didn't get solved this week. But then well, no one solved that. No one solved that yet. I mean, yep. you know, it's our job to keep poking holes at things that are still two yep. and three years. We've been ahead. a little been a little pesky about that. That's for sure. Okay, what else we got? Well, let's just um, you know before somebody you know jumps in and interrupts us. Uh, I'm curious. Maybe we can wrap a little with uh, where is the future and the direction? I guess on. Um, Acumatic and particularly, how do you see them from a maturation perspective? Where where's the company today versus what we used to see them like years ago? Well, I think I think the one thing I've noticed is is that it's just a much more sort of confident and focused Acumatica. Uh, they're very clear on what's what's different about them. They don't always do a good job of getting that across. Like one of their big challenges remains branding and, and how do you tell a story that's compelling? I mean, I think you and I have both told them in different ways that we think there's a lot of room, particularly in how they're handling licensing, for example, and data to to play that card much more widely in terms of the flexibility of licensing structure, the consumption-based models. It's pretty close to consumption-based what they use. Like those kinds of things don't get out the door enough, I think, in ways that would really tell a broader market story. But what I notice is a lot of confidence, and I think part of that is because there. A few, you go back two or three years, there were a lot of leadership shuffles in the organization, and a lot of executives moving around and coming in and out, and that's really like stabilized a lot. And so I think what you're seeing is a pretty confident group. I think from a customer vantage point, I think the there's going to be a need per, maybe for a, a customer focused conference, but I think more than just that, it's customers are going to want user group uh, activity in a much more sort of structured way. They're going to need much more sort of peer based communications with the company directly than they're getting. Um, and that's an evolution of Acumatica that's happening as you get more customers and more volume. They have a natural desire to want to organize and communicate back to you. So there's things Acumatica is going to have to do there, I think, that they haven't done as much of in the past. But, you know, I, I would classify most of their problems in the problems that you want to have category for the most part. I, I would agree. The, the, Issues you and I would t discuss would be more like uh, great problems most companies would kill to have uh, because things that happen we have 4,000 customers really aren't relevant when you have four. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, they've got they've got clearly some of that. I'll pull it up a little while ago. So I think the company is now in its right in the middle of its adolescency is where it's at. It's pretty much achieved its, if you will, its adult height and everything else. But uh, it still, it still maybe needs to, it maybe hasn't left home yet and still lives with the parents a little bit, you know, before it's ready to get out there and strike it out uh, hard and fast on its own. I tortured that analogy and my apologies to Acumatic <laughs> on that. But where I'm going with this is I can't really throw any, stones at like how they set up the partner ecosystem here uh that that has served them extraordinarily well and hopefully they don't make any abrupt changes on that um so I, i'm confident in their technology team they uh you know i think that seems to be the kind of bunch that if you you know you all you gotta do is point them in the direction and they'll go find the right industry tools whatever and they'll bring that stuff in there and get it going I would agree with you that the branding, I think, is really interesting uh, point. the The company has a brand awareness issue or name awareness issue a little bit because everyone knows who Sage and Microsoft are out there in the SMB markets because they've been around for a long, long, long time, and they have probably spent cumulatively probably a billion or more in promoting their particular brands. Acumatica has. You know they've got to they got to claw around that I guess pretty quickly, um, and I think the um, I think I think the the messaging needs to get firmed up on the branding as well. It's what does this brand actually stand for, and I think we got a teaser of that today from uh, the CEO John Roscoe when he mentioned. Um, uh, he talked about how some companies view their, what was his words? He was talking about their customers. Um, had to do with data. Yeah, ownership. Uh, yeah, and they, and they, yeah, he said some, some of our competitors think that they own their customers' data. Yeah. 
and uh and these guys have a very different kind of take on it you know that your dad is your data and your systems are kind of your systems and whatever and uh, they're not uh, they're trying to be a much better player actor in the erp space yeah and the problem is that a lot of acumatica strengths whether it's uh, oh, we have a great partner model. Well, everyone's going to say they have a great partner model. Oh, we have a great platform. Everyone says that now. We have APIs. Everyone says that now. I think where Acumatica can hit a little harder is, for example, on there. I think there's a lot of customer fatigue right now realizing that cloud in many ways is another form of lock-in. And so Acumatica can hit very hard right now in terms of how would you like a flexible pricing option that's based on your actual consumption that you can easily extend to as many users as you need to without any hassles around individual licensing? How would you like to never worry about any kind of question around indirect access or any issue around how you're consuming data? You mm -hmm. know, those to me are very powerful lines because a lot of companies haven't sorted that with their customer base. Even cloud companies have some of these issues right now. Oh, yeah. Some of the worst defenses I see on the cloud guys are... Uh you sign a deal for an initial two or three year term, and then the first renewal comes up and they went three times or four times more for the renewal. And, uh, you know, boy, that'll give you a toxic brand real quick. I, I got to tell you, I liked your point, though, because um, uh, the market clearly needs uh, a different kind of behavior out there in a response to customers. And maybe one of the things uh, I want to come back to uh, – tie these two points together when you mentioned about Alexa and machine learning and everything we were talking before every vendor has those kind of things now right like cutesy kind of demo deal and what's going to be different about Acumatica and this has to come out of their branding is Acumana has Acumatica customers have a different experience it's an experiential aspect to the branding that must come out not technical stuff it's not a sure. about Checking off, okay, artificial intelligence, check, uh, you know, Amazon AWS, check, you know, that's not going to cut it. It's what is the experience, and that's the message they and their partners have to beat home out of the marketplace. Totally, and, and just to be clear, too, when, when I'm saying things like, well, every vendor says that they have a great partner program, it doesn't mean that Acumatica can't take true advantage of of what they put into that and and how happy generally their partners are with those relationships it's just that you have to then think well the market's jaded on this messaging how can we go around that and typically what acumatica needs to do in that front is they need to basically turn partners and customers into advocates for the company right and and create ways for partners and customers to take that message out because then it can be received right yeah. so so if a customer says to the marketplace look, I had no problem integrating Acumatica with five different software programs because of their APIs and their built-in integrations. That's who can carry that message forward. Agreed. Whereas from a brand perspective, I think they can hit really hard on licensing data usage and things like that because no one, no other vendor in the market is willing to talk about that right now. So... They won't even talk to us about it, you know. We Sometimes it's like pulling teeth. Those points up. Yeah. Yep, yep. You're like, oh, here come these guys again. They're going to ask these frigging questions around data and access. Anyhow, I think we're officially overstaying our welcome. Do you have any final words? No, uh, I'm off to Miami now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'll bid adieu here. By the way, one highlight was was having a partner come right up and thanking you specifically for your leadership. You know, so that the meme lives on, Brian. The meme oh, lives I gotta on. Tell you, I, li I live for that now, man. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's hilarious when it's partners, not vendors, you know, that want to come up. And Absolutely. I thank them for being all in on uh, thanking all me. All in, for, right. You know, yeah, he, he was all in. All right, Brian, catch your plane. Thanks, man. Take care.